Okay, let's take a look at this problem here. This was a problem that was assigned on both homework number two and homework number three. We're given a state of planar stress, sigma x, sigma y, tau xy. Presumably someone solved for this state of stress on a larger element um, and determined that these values. So sigma x is negative 12 KSI, so that's pointing inwards. That's a compressive stress as indicated on the element itself. Sigma y is 22 KSI, it's positive. This leads to tension in the y direction. And tau xy is a positive 12 KSI, so it's pointing in that positive y direction on the positive x face. And we're asked to solve for sigma 1, sigma 2, our principal stresses, and the principal planes, theta p1, theta p2, as well as the max in-plane shear stress, tau max in-plane, the accompanying average normal stresses, sigma average, and the shear plane, uh, which is theta s, as shown here. Okay, so in homework number two, you solve for these quantities using our general stress transformation equations. In homework three, you re-performed, uh, re-evaluated this um, element and solved for these quantities uh, using more circle. So we're going to work through these two methods right now. So using general stress transformation equations, we were able to develop an equation for our principal stresses, sigma 1, sigma 2, it's equal to sigma x plus sigma y over 2 plus or minus the square root of sigma x minus sigma y over 2 squared plus tau xy squared. So we've developed this equation in class. We can immediately jump to this equation. Working forward, we don't need to re redevelop this each time. So looking at our state of stress, which I've circled in red above, we could just plug in these values. Sigma 1, sigma 2 is equal to negative 12 plus 22 divided by 2 plus or minus the square root of quantity negative 12 minus 22 over 2 squared plus 12 squared. Okay, so we have a plus or minus symbol in this equation. The plus symbol accounts for sigma 1. The minus, sig the minus symbol allows us to solve for sigma 2, our second principal stress. Sigma 1 is always greater than sigma 2. When we plug in these values into our calculator, sigma 1 turns out to be 25.8 KSI. Sigma 2 turns out to be negative 15.8. KSI. Our second principal stress will always be less than our first principal stress. That is to say, sigma 1 will always be greater than sigma 2 as it is in this case here. Okay, That's our convention. Well, we've just solved for the first part. The second part asks us to determine theta P1, theta P2. Okay. Well, we have a new equation that we've developed for that, and it says that the tangent of 2 theta a little messy there. Get rid of that. P1 comma 2 is equal to tau xy <clears throat> divided by the quantity sigma x minus sigma y over 2. Again, we just plug in the values from our given state of stress that was provided. When we do that, this turns out to be 12 KSI divided by negative 12 minus 22 divided by 2. Now, theta P1, theta P2 are equal to negative 17.6 degrees and 72.4 degrees. We know that these trigonometric functions are periodic, so we'll have multiple roots to this equation that we've had above. We pick two of those roots. Because we're solving for theta P1 and P2, they will be 90 degrees apart from one another always. So in this case, we have negative 17.6 and 72.4. These are, in fact, 90 degrees apart from one another. The question remains, which one is theta P1? Which one is theta P2? 
theta p1 describes the orientation of sigma 1. Theta p2 orients our element for sigma 2. Okay, these are our principal planes. Theta p1 corresponds to sigma 1. Theta p2 corresponds to sigma 2. We don't know offhand which one of these angles is theta p1 and which one is theta p2. And in order for us to determine that, we need to go back into our general stress transformation equations. Sigma x prime is equal to sigma x plus sigma y over 2 plus sigma x minus sigma y over 2 cosine of 2 theta plus tau x y sine of 2 theta. Now, we had two angles from before. We had negative 17.6 and we had 72.4 degrees. We can choose either one of these angles, plug it into this equation for theta at these two locations, and use our initial state of stress values for sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy, and solve for sigma x prime. So if I were to choose theta is equal to negative 17.6 degrees and plug it into this above equation, I'll get sigma x prime is equal to negative 12 plus 22 divided by 2 plus negative 12 minus 22 divided by 2 cosine of 2 times negative 17.6 degrees plus 12 times sine of 2 times negative 17.6 degrees. Plug this into my calculator exactly like this, obeying the signs, and I get sigma x prime is equal to negative 15.8 ksi. This value here is exactly the same as sigma 2 down here. So what we determined was that our negative 17.6 degree angle is equal to theta P2. Therefore, the other angle that we determined is equal to theta P1. The other angle we determined was 72.4 degrees. Remember our sign convention. Sign convention says that a positive angle of rotation is in the counterclockwise direction. A negative angle would therefore be in the clockwise direction. So if we took our initial element way back here and rotated it 17.6 degrees in the clockwise direction, that new X face on that element would experience sigma 2. Another way that we could consider this is if we were to take this element and rotate it 72.4 degrees positive, which is in the counterclockwise direction, its new X face would experience sigma 1, which is 25.8 KSI. They are 90 degrees apart from one another, as are the faces on a square are 90 degrees apart from one another. So how do we draw this new deformed element? Well, we take the original element and we rotate it by either a negative 17.6 degrees or a positive 72.4 degrees. So here's our initial element. And if I do this correctly, I should be able to rotate it. Say a positive 72.4 degrees. with respect to its initial x direction. This horizontal was our initial x direction. This is our new x direction. It's at 72.4 degrees. This is our new y direction, call it y prime, with respect to our initial y direction. It also rotated 72.4 degrees because X and Y are always going to be 90 degrees apart from one another. 
And what we said is that if you rotate a positive 72.4 degrees, that corresponds to theta P1. That means that on your new X face, if you rotate 72.4 degrees, you will uncover sigma 1, which we said from before was 25.8 KSI. 25.8 is a positive number. Positive, according to our sign convention, means that we are in tension. 25.8. In the other direction, sigma 2 was negative 15.8 KSI. Negative means that we are in compression. And this would be our new orientation. 15.8 KSI. And 25.8 KSI. Notice that I do not include negative numbers on my deformed element, on my rotated element. I always include positive numbers. I let the arrows of my um, on my diagram indicate the direction that they're pointing. The positives and negatives in front of these values that you're solving for just indicate whether the object is in compression or in tension. So I don't include any negative numbers on my element. I always include positive numbers, and then I draw the arrow in the direction that of the stress itself. So this is the orientation of our object uh, that feels the principal stresses. The principal stresses, sigma 1 is equal to 25.8, sigma 2 is equal to 15.8. Okay, the second part of this problem asks us to solve for max in-plane shear stress. So again, we have an equation for the max in-plane shear stress that we can immediately jump to. It's equal to the square root of sigma x minus sigma y over 2 squared plus tau xy squared. In sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy refer back to the initial state of stress that we were provided at the beginning of the problem. So if we plug in those values, we'll get the following equation. Square root of negative 12 minus 22 divided by 2 squared plus 12 squared. Tau max in plane turns out to be 20.8 KSI. Obey the pluses and minuses. If the state of stress is a negative value, you plug in a negative value for sigma x in this case. Or if it's sigma y is positive, 22 KSI, you plug in a positive 22 KSI and so forth. Plug and chug. The average normal stress is just simply the average of your two normal stresses. Sigma x plus sigma y over 2. So in this case, negative 12 plus 22 divided by 2. That leads us to 5 KSI. Okay? The orientation of your max in-plane shear stress is tangent to theta s is equal to negative sigma x minus sigma y over 2 divided by tau x y. Plugging in tangent of 2 theta s is equal to negative, negative 12 minus 22 divided by 2 over 12. Solving for theta s turns out to be 27.39 degrees. This ought to be 45 degrees away from our principal planes, which were at negative 17 and change degrees and 72 degrees. This is a positive 27.39 degrees. That is, in fact, 45 degrees away from our principal planes. OK, how do we draw this element? Well, we draw our original element, and then we rotate it. In this case, it's a positive 27.39 degrees. Our shear stress, get rid of that, 
is going to be a positive quantity, so it's going to be pointing in the positive y prime direction. The other three components of your shear stress follow suit, tip to tip, tail to tail. If this were our original x direction, this would be our new x prime direction. We have rotated through an angle of 27.39 degrees from our x to x prime direction. Our y prime direction would be pointing up and to the left like so. And that dictates the direction of our max in plane shear stress. Our max in plane shear stress was a positive number. 20.8 because it's positive that must be pointing in the positive y prime direction as it is on our x prime face in our other faces we have an average normal stress of 5 ksi it's a positive 5 ksi which means that it's feeling a tensile stress, 5 KSI, 5 KSI, and our shear stress is 20.8 KSI. Okay, at this point, we've solved the problem using our general stress transformation equations. It took us a long time to do that because there's a lot of equations for us to work through, and we need to punch into our calculators, and we need to redraw the element. The advantage of using more circle is that the problem can be solved a lot faster and we can solve for any orientation, any state of stress, much quicker than using the general stress transformation equations. So let's solve this problem now using more circle. So to recap, we had sigma x is equal to negative 12 ksi, sigma y is equal to 22 KSI, and tau XY is equal to 12 KSI. Okay, the first step we do, we perform when using more circles to determine sigma average, which is equal to sigma X plus sigma Y divided by 2. Plugging in those values, negative 12 plus 22 divided by 2, we get 5 KSI. This corresponds to the center point of our circle. Okay, so here I'm going to draw our vertical axis and our horizontal axis like so. And if I do this correctly and I use my little more circle template properly, I can trace out a circle that looks like this. Now I've solved this problem before. So I know that my Mohr circle is going to dip into the negative side of my uh, sigma axis, as you'll see. So sigma is positive to the right, and the only trick that we need to remember about tau, uh, Mohr circle is that tau xy is positive downwards. Okay, if you can remember that, the rest just follows suit. So sigma is positive to the right, and we're dealing with ksi and KSI, tau is positive downwards. So our state of stress, the circle, has a center point at 5 KSI. And when we plot our reference point, we look at sigma X and we look at tau XY. So sigma X has a value of negative 12 KSI. So we're actually going to be somewhere over here. So clearly the circle is not quite to scale. But we have sigma x is equal to negative 12 ksi, and we have tau xy is equal to a positive 12 ksi. Negative 12 and 12. Okay? So this is our reference point. This point here represents the state of stress for our element. Okay? Notice that sigma 1 corresponds to the maximum possible normal stress. Sigma 2 corresponds to the minimum possible normal stress that the object can feel. 
if we were looking for tau max in plane, we'd look to the bottom of the circle. Okay. The coordinates at any location on this circle, if I were to pick a random location, the coordinates correspond to sigma x prime tau xy prime. So all of the points on this circle represent all the possible states of stresses that we can achieve for that given element by simply rotating it in place. Okay? Okay. Well, the next step is just to look to the circle and determine its radius. The radius of the circle we can determine from Pythagorean theorem. We have a right triangle with a length along the sigma axis, a height along the tau axis, and a hypotenuse connecting those two. So our radius is just simply looking at the circle. 17 squared is the length of that one side, plus 12 squared is the length of the height. When we solve for the radius, this turns out to be 20 point eight KSI. Now determining what sigma one is, it's just a matter of adding the average and the radius of the circle together. Determining sigma two is taking the radius and subtract I'm sorry, taking the average normal stress and subtracting the radius. Pretty simple. We don't need to memorize any equations. We just look at the circle itself. Sigma 1 is equal to sigma average plus the radius. Sigma 2 is equal to sigma average minus the radius. The average was 5. The radius was 20.8. Sigma 1 is equal to 25.8. KSI. Sigma average was 5. The radius was 20.8. Sigma 2 was negative 15.8 KSI. These were the exact same values that we had solved using the general stress transformation equations. But we could do this a lot faster by just drawing a circle and using our knowledge of geometry. How about the orientation? Well, if I highlight our reference state here, we recognize that if we were to rotate the element through an angle on our Mohr circle of 2 theta P2, we would rotate it by that amount, and that new face would feel the normal stress sigma 2. What is 2 theta P2? Again, we just use our understanding of geometry and trigonometry. Tangent of 2 theta P2 is equal to opposite over adjacent. Opposite is 12, and adjacent is 17. The distance between 5 plus a negative 12, or 5 plus 12, is 17. So opposite over adjacent is 12 over 17. Theta P2 turns out to be 17.6 degrees. Now, looking at the circle, I recognize that in order to get from my reference state up to theta P2, I need to rotate through an angle in the clockwise direction. So I'm going to put a little arrow here to remind myself to rotate in the clockwise direction of 17.6 degrees. You'll recognize that this is the same angle that we determined from our general stress transformation equations, where 17.6 degrees was the negative angle, and according to our sign convention using that method, that would be a clockwise rotation. So we're completely consistent with what we've learned using our general stress transformation equations, but we've done this a lot faster uh, by just drawing the circle itself. So if we were to rotate through an angle of 17.6 degrees, we would uh, experience 
negative 15.8 KSI, which is our sigma 2 value up here. And we know that sigma 1 and sigma 2 are uh, separated by an angle of 90 degrees, because we're talking about an, an element, a square element. So that if we were to rotate through another 90 degrees beyond the 17.6 degrees, we would uncover theta uh, sigma 1. So again, looking at our element, this is our undeformed element here. If I were to take this element and rotate it 17.6 degrees like so, oops, this should be pointing in the opposite direction, but let me draw these these axes, this would be my new x-axis with respect to my initial x-axis, my new y-prime axis with respect to my initial y-prime axis. This was x, this was y, this is our new y-prime, this is our new x-prime. We've rotated through an angle of 17.6 degrees. And with that, we uncover sigma Two, which was a negative 15.8, so that must be pointing inwards. On the other faces, it's feeling a tensile stress of 20.8, or 25.8, excuse me, 25.8 KSI and 15.8. Again, I do not include negative numbers. I let the arrows do the talking for me. Okay. Last but not least, how do we solve for our max in-plane shear stress? Well, that's a piece of cake because the max in-plane shear stress is way down here at the bottom of our circle, and its coordinates are just simply the radius of our circle and the sigma coordinate, which is our average normal stress. So tau max in-plane, piece of cake. That's equal to our radius. This went way off the board here. Tau max n plane is equal to our radius. And that's equal to 20.8. And our average normal stress, that was the first thing that we solved for. That's equal to 5 KSI. What's the orientation? Theta S. Well, go back to our Mohr circle and recognize that we have a 90 degree angle separating our X and Y axes, or our vertical and horizontal axes, to be more exact. We have a 90 degree angle separating those two. A portion of that angle is eaten up by our 2 theta P2. The other portion of our angle is eaten up by 2 theta s. So we can set up an equation here that says that 90 degrees on our circle is equal to 2 theta p2 plus 2 theta s. That 90 degree angle is partly eaten up by 2 theta P2 on our Mohr circle and partly eaten up by 2 theta S. Theta S turns out to be 27.4 degrees, exactly what we saw for in the first part. Okay, What direction? Well, it's the same direction that we had to rotate through on our Mohr circle. If we go back to Mohr circle, we saw that our reference state was down here, and we had to rotate through an angle in the counterclockwise direction, 27.4 degrees. So I draw that arrow to remind myself that we're going to rotate 27.4 degrees. Here's our element. I rotate 27.4 degrees like so. My initial x direction, my initial y direction, my new x direction, my new y direction. We rotated through 
27.4 degrees. When we do that, we uncover our max in-plane shear stress, which is a positive 20.8 KSI, and the two, well, all four faces feel a positive 5 KSI normal stress. So the positive 20.8 KSI must be pointing in our y prime direction. Or to fill these in, x, x prime, y, and y prime. The other three directions follow suit. 20.8 KSI is our max in-plane shear stress. And on the other four faces, we feel a positive 5 KSI, which leads us into tensile stress. 5 KSI and 5 KSI. This is exactly the same element that we had developed using our general stress transformation equations before. The two methods are equivalent, but believe it or not, more circle is faster and it shows us more information because I don't need to keep just plugging into an equation. I can always go back to this circle and I can determine the state of stress at any location on this circle. This circle is an infinite number of points describing the infinite number of states of stress that are available for our given element. Any one of those points, again, represents sigma x and tau xy.